Welcome to this class or course, uh, which we've entitled an advanced introduction to Git. Um, I think most of you will be familiar with Git already in that most of you probably know about it. You have probably used it. Uh, you know how to use Git for simple tasks like checking in files, checking them out. Uh, you've probably been introduced to services like GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket or coding or similar services. Um, if you haven't, then please say so. But anyway, I'll presume that you've, you at least have some experience with Git. Uh, although we will start at square one, we're going to go back to basics. But this is an advanced introduction, meaning that we're going to delve into some details uh, about how Git works internally uh, that will be easier to follow if you've seen Git before, which again, I presume you have. Uh, and again, tell me if you have, tell me if you haven't. Now, the first thing uh, I want you to do is to tell me what Git is? What is Git? Um, in your own words, short sentence or phrase, what is Git as a tool? What is it used for? And I'm going to give you uh, half a minute to uh, get back to me on that. And I'll sit here and drink my tea until I get some answers. <laughs> uh, Uri, full of puns as always. So guys, get. What is it? <laughs> Kalanga is saying that Git is a version control tool. Yes, yes, right. It's a version control tool. Uh, what does that mean? <laughs> is that all it is? Lucid is saying that Git's basically a tool that's used to save, clone, etc., in order to have good programs. Okay, so there we go. It's uh, it's a tool that allows you to do something with your code. You can save it, you can version it, you can transfer it to someone else who might use it to uh, well, who might contribute to the code, so they can clone the code. They can add to it and contribute back to the project. So in addition to supporting version control, it uh, also supports a collaborative workflow. It allows us to work together on a project. <laughs> Colango is also saying it's a magic saving tool. And yes, Git sometimes feels like magic. And uh, that's one of the things where it, uh, going to do in this course, we're going to take some of that magic away. We're going to make it work less as a black box and try and understand what's actually going on under the hood. Uh, it's used to manage different versions of the program during the development stage. Very good, very good, good answers. Uh, we're going to come back to uh, the different ways in which we can use Git but we're going to focus on the keyword uh, version control first, just to uh, know exactly what it entails to be a version control tool. So let me see if I can bring up the slides. Uh, hopefully you have some slides on your screen now, an advanced introduction to Git. And yes, as I said, we're going to cover how Git works behind the scenes. We're now going to be talking about what version control is. Later in the course, uh, after we've talked about the internals and what Git is and what it enables us to do, we'll look at collaborative tools like GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, etc. And 
we'll look a little bit at how Git can be used in a modern software company uh, with modern workflows like continuous integration and continuous delivery. That's at the very end of the course. Uh, the slides, very good question, Kalango. The slides, you, you'll uh, be able to find the slides here at this URL, umutsi.gitlab.io slash git dash slides. I'll give you a few, well, a few seconds, half a minute to open up the slides in your browser so you can follow along if you want to. Uh, there are, uh, it's uh, an HTML document. The slides are all, uh, you can all look at the slides in your browser. Um, they're hyperlinked, etc. Please tell me when you've uh, got the slides open in your browser so I know if I can continue or not. Is everyone with me so far? umutsi.gitlab.io slash git dash slides. Got a thumbs up from Peter. I'm going to assume that you've had enough time to actually get to the slides now. So let's move on. What is a version control system? That's the first question we're going to talk about. And it exists in order to solve a very common problem, uh, which exists across many different domains. Namely, you, you want to create a piece of work. It could be an essay. It could be uh, a movie. It could be a uh, uh, piece of music. Or it could be uh, your code base implementing a product or idea that you have. And whenever you work on something, that work will change over time. You start out writing your essay and you start either jotting down your thoughts or you write the introduction first. Maybe you like to start writing the conclusion first. Wherever you start, whatever you do, you start somewhere and you add to your work. And of course, one of the common problems of doing things is that you'll do something wrong. You made an error, your argument wasn't as cogent and cohesive as you thought it would be. You didn't like the musical idea that you developed, so you want to change your composition. Uh, the, the way you cut and edited your movie uh, wasn't to your taste, so you want to change that. So sometimes you, you have to undo work that you've already done, go back to a previous version. Also, sometimes you branch off in different directions. You try uh, a certain, you try to write your essay in a certain style, you go back, you change it, and you find that maybe there are pieces of, both pieces of work now that I want to integrate into a new whole. Uh, so another, uh, um, another action we need to be able to take when we're working with different versions, different editions of the same piece of work, we have to be able to take different editions of that work and integrate the pieces into a new whole. So a version control system does that for us. Of course, it is a problem that most of us have encountered already before we even had version control uh, systems uh, at our disposal. So I'm not sure if some of you might recognize this situation, either when you wrote uh, essays in school or you worked on some projects uh, where you started out working on it, you decided, I need to make some changes now, I'm not sure if I should save it or not and what to do. So you just copied the entire file or folder, gave it a new name. After a while, uh, you run out of names to give it and things can get pretty messy. <laughs> <laughs> so what do we want to do with a version control system? Uh, we want to be able to check out an existing version, of course, 
uh, that of course means that we have to be able to check in new versions after we've made changes to an old one. Uh, also, we need to be able to integrate work between two versions. And what I didn't write here is that we'd probably want to keep track on uh, keep track of what version came from what other version, so that we have a uh, sort of uh, uh, we have an idea of how these things are connected, how the individual pieces of work are connected to each other. Uh, we'll look at how that is done, what kind of model is needed to do that later today. Anyway, when we have a version control tool, there are different, there are many different tools out there. Git is not the only version control tool on the market. Version control tools have existed for decades. Uh, and uh, they, they follow different distribution models, different ways in which you connect to the tool and to the database. Uh, a very common form of version control is the centralized version control model. That's where you have a central repository, that's the database that keeps your work. And if you want to work, if you want to add to the work, if you want to check something out, you need to connect to that central database, that central repository, uh, cloning the work first, making changes, then committing them to, uh, to the th central server. Now, this might seem very different to how you're using Git today. Uh, however, you, know, you, you probably know that you don't have to be connected to the internet at all in order to use Git. With a centralized version control system, you need to be able to connect to that server. If it resides on your own computer, well, that's great. But if someone else wants to connect to it, the repository has to be available via the network. You can't do anything. You can't make any changes to the file database uh, without actually connecting to that computer that has the central repository. Uh, of course, uh, it's a very simple model to understand. It's also a simple model to implement. So a lot of the early, well, most early uh, VCS tools followed the, uh, followed the centralized version control model. Also, a lot of tools that are available today uh, still are centralized version control tools, uh, even some very, very popular ones. So this is a model that many of you might have to follow if you, uh, for example, join a company that uses SVN as its version control tool. But anyway, there is another model out there and it's the distributed version control model. Um, and with the distributed system, everyone has their own repository. Everyone has their own file database. Um, and then you need to have some workflow uh, that will keep these repositories in sync. Uh, one way of doing that is to have, again, a central repository, which, that, which you will uh, keep updated by explicitly pushing and pulling, well, pushing to it and pulling from it at uh, different points in time. But whenever you work on your own local files, you will have your own local repository that you can uh, check files into and uh, get files out of whenever needed. So this is probably something that you've seen already. But what you can't see on this picture in front of you is that since everyone basically has their own repository, everyone can, in principle, connect to everyone else. So if you have a repository, I can connect to your repository and pull files from it, or you can push files to my repository, etc. So it's a very generalized model, which means that you, you have to implement a workflow that will keep the entire system in sync. And that adds complexity to the system. And it's one of the ways in which Git is more complex than a centralized tool than, say, a Subversion, SVN. Uh, so in order to use Git efficiently, uh, you need to use a workflow uh, that keeps the system in sync. And of course, one of those uh, 
uh, is probably the model that you're using already, the simple shared repository model. It might look very similar to the uh, centralized model in that you have a shared repository, uh, which resides probably on something like GitHub or GitLab. It's a repository that everyone connects to. Then you push to that repository uh, in order to uh, to make your changes to the code public to everyone else. And you pull from it to get everyone else's changes. Uh, of course, what, what you can't see in this diagram is that every developer here has uh, his or her own repository as well, right? Like we saw in the previous diagram. So what happens is that you push to your repository and pull from it locally when you're ready to make your changes public. You push uh, to the shared repository, everyone else gets your code from the shared repository. Uh, and that's great for, say, smaller or medium-sized, even larger companies. It's great if you have a personal project. It's great if you're working within a, a single group. Uh, but for larger distributed projects like open source projects where people are basically entering the project and exiting the project at any point in time, uh, it's not a feasible model to use. So there's an even more complex model where uh, you use what's called forking, which is something you might have heard about already, in order to copy the entire uh, main repository of the project, which is now called a blessed repository. That's the one that holds the uh, sort of truth, the, the code that is public to everyone and that ought to be public to everyone before it's been verified. If you want to make changes to the blessed repository, you first fork it, uh, you get your own public repository. Uh, and whenever you make changes to the project, you'll clone your own uh, developer repository, the public developer repository. You make changes locally. When you're happy that your local changes are okay, you push to the public repository, your own public repository that is, and then you send a pull request to an integration manager. One of the people who, uh, have access to the blessed repository. You ask them to pull the changes that you've made public. The integration manager will locally integrate your code into the official code and push it to the blessed repository. This is done in a lot of open source projects. Uh, of course, sometimes open source projects grow to a size where having a single integration manager or just a few integration managers is not feasible. And one of those projects is the Linux kernel as in the core of the entire Linux operating system, which is a huge open source operating system. Now it's a huge <laughs> open source project, sorry. Uh, I think something like between 10 and 20,000 different people have worked on that uh, code base uh, at, any point, at, uh, at any given point in time. Uh, no, sorry, in total, of course, between 10 and 20,000 people have worked on it. Uh, when you have a system that big, you basically have to split it into subsystems uh, that are guarded by lieutenants. Lieutenants defer to a dictator uh, who control the blessed repository. All the developers, all the lieutenants have their own public repositories. They're not in this graph. Uh, this is this works amazingly well. Uh, Git was basically developed by the core Linux team. Git was developed by the core Linux team in order to solve the problem of how to manage the Linux code base. So Linus Torvalds, the guy who single-handedly started the Linux kernel, uh, in, in two weeks wrote the essentials of Git, created his own version control tool, and it's now become one of the most popular tools out there. So uh, great things are coming out of the Linux community. Uh, that's what I have to say about that. So yeah, but anyway, uh, the workflow that most of you will be using most places is of course the simple model and it's more than good enough for 99% of projects. 
Now, as I said, there are different tools out there and we're, we won't discuss those, but you might be forced to use them. Subversion is probably the most common tool next to Git. It used to be the most common tool by far, uh, but Git is now taking its place, so to speak. Also, Microsoft, if you're working in a Microsoft shop, uh, you might have to use their team, team foundation services. Now, uh, they implemented their own centralized version control system, but from the last version on, uh, apparently you can decide to uh, switch out the native version control with Git instead. <laughs> so even if you're using Team Foundation services, you don't have to use Team Foundation version control. Then there's Mercurial, which is pretty similar to Git. It's also a distributed uh, VCS and yes, Git, which we're discussing today. These are probably the four most common ones. So have any of you used any other version control tools than Git? And I don't count uh, copying the files and giving them new names. <laughs> Has any of you used Subversion, for example, or even heard of it? No. Well, you're lucky. Nope. <laughs> No. So the great thing is that once you've understood Git, oh, so Sidney is saying he's used Tortoise SVN. Uh, and that is a uh, subversion client. That's, uh, that's very interesting. Uh, now, I think they've also developed a overlay for Tortoise SVN that, um, in, that works against Git servers and with a Git workflow. So I think that tool can be used both with Subversion and Git, but I'm not entirely sure about that. Anyway, if you're in the Windows world, Tortoise SVN is one of the tools that you will probably see and encounter. Very common. Okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to get down to the gritty details of how Git works inside. We're going to see what everything, well, we're going to look at the primitive objects that Git uh, uses internally in order to make version control possible. We're going to understand how the components fit together. Um, and we're going to build an understanding of what, well, firstly, <laughs> how to use Git, but also what to do when something goes wrong, which is something I think a lot of you have encountered already. Uh, first thing we need to do is to cover a couple of uh, preliminaries. Uh, a few uh, uh, topics from outside the realm of version control that we need to understand uh, to understand what happens. The first of those topics is hashes and hash functions. I'm wondering how many of you uh, have heard about hashes and hash functions before? Is it a word that you know already? Uh, if you've taken a class or a course on, say, algorithms and data structures, uh, which is which can be a very useful topic to at least look at as a developer, you might have come across them. Uh, just so, just tell me if this is a hash is a word you've heard about before. A hash function is that something that rings a bell, or is it completely new to you? It'd be great to know approximately how many of you know at least what it is and at what kind of level. Yeah, some of you have heard about it. Uh, some of you have not. Some of you have heard about it, but have forgotten about it. And for some of you, it's the first time you hear about it. Well, good. Uh, it's definitely one of the, those words that you need to have heard, that you need to know about, and that you probably will encounter as a programmer because they are tools that are used a lot. Uh, either for the purpose of what we're going to see today or internally in data structures like hash maps, for example, which is a very, very useful data structure that if you haven't heard about it, you should look it up at some point. 
Uh, let's get back to the slides. Hashes and hash functions. Yeah, Lucas has heard about hash algorithms. And that's right, a hash algorithm is uh, essentially the same as a hash function. And what is a hash function? Uh, a hash function, and I'm going to read off the slide and we'll talk more about it, is a function or a procedure or a program, choose whatever term you're comfortable with, which takes a chunk of data as input and returns a number or string, generally of limited size. And this is important, it's of limited size. Uh, and usually, generally much smaller than the data. Uh, that number that you get uh, is called a hash or string, if you get a string, it's still called a hash. And you can think of that hash as a fingerprint, which uniquely identifies the data. So basically you can take a huge document uh, of any size at all, meaning there's, uh, uh, there's an infinite space of possible files here. And you feed it to the hash function, to the program, to the routine, to the algorithm, and it reduces it to a number. And that number is smaller than some finite set size. Uh, so that means of course that a document isn't given a unique number, that wouldn't be possible, but it's given a number uh, that you can use to identify it. And similarly to, uh, similar to a fingerprint, uh, by nature's side, uh, there's a certain finite space of the number of fingerprints you can have. Uh, and every person has a fingerprint, but the probability of two people having the same fingerprint is so low that uh, we use fingerprints as a reliable way of identifying people. And you can think of hashes in the same kind of way. Even though hashes aren't mathematically unique, botanically unique, uh, two files having the same hash is such an unlikely uh, coincidence uh, that for all intents and purposes, it won't happen. A hash function of the kind that we're talking about today uh, will have some features. First of all, of course, it'll have to return the same hash for identical input. So if you hash a file today, you'll get the same answer as if you hashed the file yesterday and if you hashed it tomorrow. Uh, again, I reiterate a hash is of limited size. Uh, the uh, hash algorithm that Git uses will, um, will reduce a file to 40 hex digits, uh, which is much smaller than the general file. Also, one of the features that uh, a hash function in this case has, in Git has, uh, is that a small change in the input data should lead to a big difference in the hash. And that's true for most hash functions. Uh, the reason is that we want to be able to use hash functions to, uh, to uh, discriminate between changes in files in such a way that it's statistically very unlikely that if you take a collection of files, they end up being correlated. The hashes end up being correlated uh, and you can use information about the hashes to extract information about the files. That's a much bigger topic that I don't want to talk about today and it's not needed. Uh, let me see now. Oh, my slides locked up. Can you see the slides moving on your screens? Because I can't see that happening on my screen. Uh, that's very strange. Okay, there we're back. Okay, now the question is, what can we use hash functions for? Uh, a very common use of them is with uh, checksums or digests. It used to be that when you copied files across the network, that process could be unreliable, as in you transferred the bits and bytes of that file across the network, 
uh, the data could flip for electrical reasons and the file you copied would be different from the file on the source computer. Now, what can you do in order to verify that the file that you got is the same as the file on the source computer? What you can do is you can compare checksums. You can compare the hashes of the files. Uh, very common. That means that instead of <laughs> transferring the file back and forth, trying to identify whether the bits and bytes are the same, you just uh, copy a very limited number. You check that the numbers are the same. If they are, you're good. Um, another one, which is what we're using in Git, we're using it to verify file identity, which is uh, basically the same thing. Uh, we I, we reduce the file to its hash. We're saying that if you have a file and it has the same file, it has the same hash as my file. We have the same files, and that's uh, something that is done in Git with files and with commits. So instead of comparing huge sets of files, uh, megabytes and megabytes, even gigabytes of data. Uh, Git will just compare a simple hash, and if the hashes match, the data uh, is uh, presumed to match as well. That makes things very, very fast. Um, also, we talk about hash maps and fast lookups. Uh, if you have a, this huge number of documents or files you need to sort uh, in such a way that you can look them up later, what you can do is you can bin them by hash. Uh, that makes it very fast to look things up later. You, you, you reduce a document to a number, you use that number as an index, uh, and that makes looking things up in a database really fast. Uh, before we move on uh, to all uses, I'm going to uh, actually show you how this works. So let me see now. I have a text file here. That's book1.txt. All right, before we move on though, I'm going to point out something that Yuri uh, uh, told us in the chat. Out of interest, the last digit of your national ID is a checksum digit. That is absolutely, that's probably correct. It's definitely correct in Norway as well. Uh, the last part of your uh, national ID will uh, say something about the integrity of that idea, ID. If you write down a, down a random number, that should not be a valid uh, national ID. And uh, a checksum will prevent you from just taking any ID or any number and present it as if it's an ID. This exists everywhere. Lots of codes that are used to identify people will have checksums and checksum digits built into them. And it's a very common use of hashes. So it's a very, very good example to bring up. Now let's have a look at book1.txt, which I have here. And I hope you can see my terminal on screen. I also hope that some of you uh, were, uh, attended my Linux course and your happy and comfortable with seeing a terminal on the screen. Uh, if not, uh, I'm throwing you off the deep end. Uh, let's open book one and see what it is. It's actually a copy of Crime and Punishment. And it's 22,000 lines long. So it's a big file. Now, let's say you have a copy of my, of the file, of that text. So I'm going to copy book1.txt to book2.txt. Now we have two copies of this file. Let's see. Uh, these files are the exact same size, uh, 1.2 million bytes, etc. But how do I know if the files are identical? Well, I could run a uh, uh, I can run the file through a hash algorithm like MD5, which is a very common uh, hash algorithm for message digests, MD, which is essentially uh, reducing a file to a print so we can check its integrity. Book1.txt and the hash is 
in hex, f1, f422, etc. So and what did md5 uh, sum do here? Uh, it took the entire content of the file book1.txt, it put it through a mathematical procedure that reduced that entire file to the string of hexadecimal digits that you can see here, f1, f422, etc. Now, if I do the same to book2.txt, that's a different file, but with the same identical content, and it gives you the same exact hash. Let's try a different hash algorithm. Let's try SHA1. If we do that to book1, that gives us a longer hash, because a SHA sum, a SHA1 has more digits, uh, but it starts with 3d7. Let's do the same to book2. And it gives us the same hash. Okay, what if someone came and they took our book2 document and they tampered with it? They went to some random line, say line 10,000, and they changed a small m to a capital M. Maybe that's something that has huge consequences in our source code or in our legal document or whatnot. Well, now it'd be very difficult for us to find that change by going through the file line by line, at least if we did it manually. Uh, but a simple way of checking if the files are the same, let's check the message digest, md 5 sum book onetxt and it gives us the same hash as, uh, as just now, as it should. If we look at book two now, it has a completely different hash. The first one starts with F1F422. This one is DA2A, etc. All we did was to change a single letter uh, from a capital M, uh, no, from a small M to a capital M. Uh, that changed the entire hash to something completely unidentifiable. Uh, a small change will lead to huge changes in hash. Uh, there's no way around it. And now we can also identify the file by its hash. If you hash all your files in your system and I ask you, do you have file the file with hash F1F422? Uh, I, uh, I will then know that you have version one of the book, of the text. Uh, if I ask you if you have the one with hash 2A2128, etc., uh, and you answer in the affirmative, I know that you have book 2.txt, uh, a different edition from the first one. Yeah. Does that make sense? Does it make sense for some of you? Re rewound the video? Are you still catching up or are you still with me? So, uh, well, uh, as Uri said, uh, starting out today, uh, it's great that, well, you know, if, if you're not following this along at the pace I'm going, uh, either watch the video at twice the speed so you can catch up and so that we're all at the same page and uh, uh, we can communicate in real time. Uh, or go back and rewatch it later because the videos will stay on YouTube. Uh, back to the slides. Uh, so some uses um, that you'll see of hash functions outside of what we've talked about is uh, you'll find it used in cryptography. Like hash functions are called the workhorse of cryptography. They're everywhere. And uh, cryptography is of course the study of how to keep files safe and secret from other people or how to make sure that no one can tamper with your files and data. Uh, and two very, uh, well, two uses that we can understand right now, it, it's everywhere. So these are just two examples out of literary, literally hundreds of examples. Um, you can use a hash as a commitment. 
Say that uh, you're in a bidding process or a tendering process and you want to commit to a bid without actually revealing what the bid is, which is very common in auctions. You can commit to a bid by publishing a hash of it. Of course, this means that your hash function has to be of a form where you can't just take the hash and go backwards and find out what bid uh, you probably submitted. So cryptographic hash functions will have some properties that ordinary hash functions don't. But if you have this kind of secure hash function, you publish your commitment, you publish the hash of your bid. Uh, and uh, and uh, once, everyone is, once everyone is ready to reveal their bids in order to find out who, who won the tendering process or the bidding process, uh, you, uh, you then submit the actual bids and people can verify that the bid you committed to is the same as the bid you're revealing. Also, uh, when you have digital signature schemes, as in when you want to sign a document digitally, uh, usually what you do is you reduce a file to its hash and uh, the signature becomes a computation that involves that hash. So the hash is used to identify the data that you're signing. That makes it possible to reduce a signature to a small mathematical procedure on numbers of limited size. So, okay, uh, Michelle is asking if we could briefly revise before moving on. And uh, of course we can do that. Uh, the main takeaway um, from this is that a hash takes a file and returns a number. That number is a fingerprint of that file. Uh, that, the number, the hash, which is what we're going to call that number, uh, is not unique, but it's unique enough that whenever you see that number, uh, you can be pretty sure that the person who generated that number had the same data, the same file uh, that you did, if you had data that produced the same hash. So does that make sense? Uh, is there anything that isn't clear? Is there anything we should go back and talk about when it comes to hashes? While you answer me, I'm just going to mention that there are tons of different hash algorithms out there. And those hash functions fulfill different niches and therefore they have certain different properties. I mentioned that some hashes are cryptographic hashes, which, are, uh, which make it very difficult to go back from a hash and find the file that it was likely to come from, for example. The hash doesn't reveal anything about the original file. MD5, which I showed you, is a really fast hash algorithm. It'll reduce a file to a hash really fast, like gigabytes of data in a split second. But uh, it does actually probabilistically reveal information about the original data. So you couldn't use it for cryptographic purposes. It's still very common. Um, then there is CRC, which is not actually a hash function per se. It's what it's used for is to take a piece of data and reduce it to a checksum. Uh, and that checksum is used to verify the identity of the data, but the CRC will uh, contain some information about what happened to the data if, it's, if, if something happened to it. So if, if you transmitted a piece of data over the wire uh, and, uh, and a bit flipped, uh, CRC will be able to tell you that a bit flip, a bit flip happened. Um, CRC is used uh, in data packets that you're sending across the network. Basically, every single data packet that you send from your computer and out onto the internet will be put into a data packet that contains at its tail end a checksum of that data. And that's how data integrity is kept when you're sending data across long distances or even your local network. And then uh, the main family that we need to talk about is the SHA family. It's a family of hash algorithms. I'm saying it's a family of hash algorithms because they're very similar to each other, uh, but they produce hashes of different sizes. SHA1, which is the first algorithm in this family, that's the hash function that Git uses. So when we're talking about hashes in Git, uh, SHA1 will be the kind of hash function we're, ta we're talking about. 
Uh, SHA-1 produces 40 hex digits, um, uh, which is 80 bytes. SHA-256, well, yes, 80 bytes, um, I think, yes. Uh, SHA-256 produces hashes that are 256 bytes, 256 bits. I have to look that up. Uh, anyway, there are different sizes. Uh, and the algorithms are also slightly different. The main takeaway here is Git is SHA-1, at least for the time being. So, hashes, ubiquitous in Git, they're used to address objects and compare them, and we'll look at where that happens inside Git later. SHA-1 is the hashing algorithm, and if you want to check what hash Git assigns to a file, you can use the Git command to do that. So let's try and do that. Let me bring the terminal back up. And let's try and use git hash file book onetxt uh, Ooh, git hash file is not a command. Interesting. So I'm lying to you. Let me find out. Oh dear. Git hash blob. Uh, blob, is that what it is? Git hash. Oh, this is embarrassing. Give me us, give me 30 seconds to figure out what the right command is. Git hash object, I think. Git. Okay, git hash dash object book one there we go we actually got a hash oh wait look at that look at me being confused i actually wrote git hash dash object on the slide i need to read what i write myself dear lord here we go git hash object book one that produces that hash And hash object book two produces that hash. 40 hex digits, I think. And of course, very different because book one and book two actually differ in a single letter. So let's see. Uh, Thandiwa is saying that he remembers using MD5 to encrypt passwords. That's very interesting because you can use MD5. So hashing is definitely something you see done to passwords. Uh, when you talk about security uh, and storing passwords safely, you're told that in order to store passwords safely, they have to be hashed and salted. Uh, that basically means that you have to generate a small token that for the user, specifically to the user, randomly. You put that together with a password and you hash that combination. And that makes it possible to compare a password that the user supplies to you and check if it matches what the user's password is without actually storing the password itself. And that's uh, not just useful, it's pretty much necessary. You should never store passwords in clear text. If you ever have to store passwords or any, any kind of sensitive credentials, make sure they're hashed. However, MD5 should never be used to hash passwords because it's not a cryptographically secure hash. Uh, so basically, if you use MD5 to hash passwords, you will probably leak some information about what that password is. So yes, do use hash algorithms to to reduce password passwords to uh, to hashes uh, that you can use to check passwords, but don't use MD5 for it. I'm very sorry if I um, <laughs> it's a she. <laughs> okay, I'm I'm very sorry. Uh, that's what happens when you're used to Scandinavian names. Uh, so, <laughs> glad you're correcting me. <laughs> okay. So that's all we have to say about hashes. Um, which one do you suggest for passwords? 
Well, that's a very good question. Uh, I was going to say Shaw. Uh, I think Shaw is or used to be cri cryptographically secure. However, an attack against SHA-1 was published last year. Uh, so SHA-1 is no longer cons uh, considered secure. So you shouldn't use that either. Um, so at this point, I'm not really happy to give you any advice because I haven't checked with the cryptographic community what you ought to use. I think Blowfish is the one that's considered, uh, well, at least one of the ones that are still con considered secure. Uh, but this is something that you really have to uh, c consult the uh, InfoSec, information security community about. They will know about it. They will also have solutions about it. Thing is, when it comes to cryptographic security, generally, you never want to implement your own, uh, your, your own uh, crypto system in order to keep things secure, because unless you've studied InfoSec and you've studied cryptography, uh, it's very easy to make mistakes that'll compromise your system. So in, in the case of information security, talk to the experts. Now, before we move on, do you want a five minute break? Uh, because I know we've covered a lot of material now. We have one more topic to cover today. Uh, and it's also a little bit abstract. Uh, so I'm thinking maybe we should take a five minute break just so everyone can, can digest what they just heard and uh, maybe catch up if you're still catching up. Uh, does that sound good to you? That sounds great. Very good. I'm going to go and make myself another cup of tea. I'll be back in five minutes. Sounds fair? Very good. Okay. I'll switch back to the static image. There. 
Okay, I think we're back. Well, I am. The question is, are you? Yes, people are back. The tea is great. So this is tea how I like it. It's Irish tea, milk, and sugar. Not the healthiest alternative, uh, but maybe the heartiest. I, I love it. So everyone's ready, very good. Now I'm going to just backtrack a little bit because Lissetti had a very good question. Uh, uh, I don't want to say he or she because I've made that mistake. They <laughs> asked, um, is this similar to what the blockchain does in terms of making sure that the transaction is correct? Now, I'm not sure if all, uh, all of you have heard about the blockchain, but it's an essential part of, uh, well, uh, bit currencies like Bitcoin. Uh, well, essentially, uh, well, the bit, the currencies differ in how they're implemented, but at least Bitcoin uses blockchain technology. And hashes are actually a very important part of how a blockchain works. Um, it's used to implement the tamper-free property of the blockchain. And it's also what makes Git graphs uh, well, in this case, not tamper free, but it's what makes the history of a Git graph possible to verify. Uh, let's see if we can explain this simply. Uh, in, in the blockchain, you have the concept of what's called a hash pointer. And a hash pointer is basically just uh, the, uh, a way of referring to other blocks on the chain. So think of a block as a piece of data, and that piece of data has its own address. Uh, that address is the hash of the block. Uh, now the thing is that every block includes the hash of the previous block. Uh, so you're pointing to the previous block with a hash. What does that give us? That means if someone tampers with a block inside the blockchain, the hash of that block will change. Of course, it'll change hugely. <coughs> and that's the feature of the hash, right? Well, what about all the blocks that came after it in the blockchain? Well, they refer back to the previous block by hash. Now, the hash of the previous block just changed. So in order to tamper with that block, you also have to tamper with the next block up the chain and the next block up the chain, etc., etc. So hash pointers are used to affix blocks to the blockchain and make the blockchain tamper-proof. Uh, so Michelle is asking what a blockchain is, and that is a huge topic that I really don't want to cover, but if you're interested, if you haven't heard about it, I encourage you to go and look the word up because it's a buzzword uh, that just, you see it everywhere now. Lots of companies out there are advertising, going into the blockchain space, building technologies based on blockchains and so on. And a lot of it is a, a lot of crap and some of it is really great and novel. So it's at least a word you should be on the lookout for. Uh, Matsebi is asking if blockchain pointers are implemented the same way as C++ pointers. Now we're going into really integrated technical details here. No, so pointers in C++, they're actually addresses of memory, uh, of virtual memory. Uh, a pointer is an address of, uh, of basically a location inside your computer's working memory. Uh, however, on the blockchain, it's a distributed system. So the data doesn't really reside in any one person's memory or RAM or computer. It uh, exists on the network. So a different kind of addressing system is used. So it's the same, um, it's not even, it, 
and they're they're different. They're a bit different. Uh, we, you're basically using the hash of the data as an address for that data, whereas in C++, you're using the physical uh, physical location, or at least the location uh, inside your computer's working memory as the uh, as the data for the pointer. So those are a bit different. Okay, let's move on. And let me see if I can bring up the slides again. There we go. Directed acyclic graphs. That's our next topic. And, uh, eh, or well, they're, they're called DAGs. People refer to them as DAGs. Might sound like a big scary word. Uh, it's a very useful structure. And we will uh, at least need to see them and uh, understand them from a very general, generalistic point of view in order to look at what commits are in the Git world. So yeah, what are DAGs? What are directed acyclic graphs? Well, first of all, a directed acyclic graph is a certain kind of directed graph. Now, what's a directed graph? It's basically a structure that consists of two components. It consists of nodes and it consists of edges. Now, if you ask uh, some computer scientists and some mathematicians, they'll say they're not called nodes. They're called vertices. A graph has, uh, well, one vertex, many vertices. Uh, but uh, lots of people refer to them as nodes. Uh, so I decided to call them nodes. Um, now, uh, the nodes are discrete uh, entities uh, that are connected by edges. And edges have a direction and go from one node to a different node. Now, what an edge cannot do in this definition of a directed graph is to go from a node to itself. So we're not going to allow for graphs that have loops. So if we want a pictographic representation of what this looks like, it would be this. Here we have six nodes labeled A, B, C, D, E, F, and we have edges going between them. There's an edge from A to B, an edge from B to C, C to E, etc., etc. here. No edge between D and F, at least not directly. So this graph consists of, well, two pieces of data, the nodes and the edges. The edges have a direction. The edges can't go from, say, A to A or B to B. Does that make sense? That's the data that defines what's called a directed graph. It's a model in that uh, it consent, uh, the model consists only of information about some type of objects that we call nodes and how they are connected. So Uri is saying that this graph is cyclic and he is correct because we're not talking about acyclic graphs yet. We're now just con considering directed graphs, and we haven't come to the acyclic keyword yet. But Uri is absolutely right in that this graph, this graph has a cycle, which is the next word I was going to introduce to you. Namely, you can get from a node to and back to itself by following a sequence of edges. So you can get from B to C, C to E, E to D, and D back to B, and that's a cycle. So that makes this graph a directed graph, but not an acyclic one. And again, I'm just going to bring up another example of an acyclic, no, sorry, not of a graph. It's a directed graph. This one is not acyclic either, because you can get from D to C and from C back to D again, for example. So yeah, this is what a directed graph looks like, or at least how you can represent it. What is essential here is not what it looks like on paper. The data is what nodes do you have and how are they connected? Uh, now, 
directed acyclic graphs then are directed graphs, but they have no cycles. So you can't start at the node, follow the arrows, and end up at the same node. And of course, we mean following the nodes in, uh, in a certain direction from start to end. So you don't follow, uh, you don't follow an edge in the opposite order of where it goes, right? A cycle is one where you, you follow the edge from beginning to end and you follow the next one from beginning to end. And at some point you're back at the node where you started. Uh, now, in DAGs, DAGs are different from just any old directed graph in that we can actually talk about ancestry. Uh, because once you can't go back from a node to itself, we can classify nodes as being ancestors or descendants of each other. Like if you can get from A to B, then we will say that B is an ancestor of A. In other words, in our uh, uh, in this way of defining ancestry, a, uh, a node will point back to its ancestor, and we'll, we're going to talk about direct ancestors as parents and direct descendants as children. So basically, children point to their parents. Uh, so if we bring up an example of an actual acyclic graph, an actual DAG, you can see here there are no cycles. Uh, a points to his parent, which is B. B has several parents, C and D. And of course, we're calling them parents. Uh, with DAGs, you're allowed to have as many parents as you want, which is a nice world to be in, maybe. Uh, you can also have as many children as you want. Uh, here, A has B as a parent, B has C and D as a parent, and E as well, actually. B has C, E, and D as parents. Uh, F is E's uh, parent, E is F's child. And if we look at E's uh, descendants, we can get from E back to C. So of course, C is a child, but uh, B is C's child. So B is also uh, of course, B is also E's direct child, so fine. E, from we get from E back to B, B back to A, so A is also a descendant of E. <laughs> okay, yeah, did you follow me there? So you can, uh, you can follow the lines back, you can follow the arrows backwards from E to B, B to A, therefore A is E's descendant, uh, E is A's ancestor. Does that make sense to you? Or did I just make things difficult to understand now? So this is one of the things that sets DAGs apart from other graphs. In a DAG, in a directed acyclic graph, you have a notion of ancestry. Of course, in an ordinary graph, if you talked about ancestors, suddenly you could become your own parent or your own child. And that's a strange notion of ancestry. So Sydney is saying B is both a child and a grandchild of E. And that is absolutely correct. It's both a child and a grandchild. Motseb is saying that this reminds you of a tree data structure. And it definitely should because it's a, a, a directed graph is a generalization of uh, a tree. Trees are directed graphs. Well, as long as your tree data structure has a direction, that is. So that's, uh, that's uh, very observant, very good. And yeah, yet another example of a directed acyclic graph. Uh, I think this is actually a sketch of a Git repository. <laughs> so we're going to see how uh, git commits actually fit into what I would call the most important data structure that you need to know about git, namely the commit graph. Uh, but for now, we'll just talk about DAGs in the abstract. So the thing is, 
If you want to keep track of modifications of something, you actually very naturally get the structure of a DAG. Uh, and we do that by letting a node represent a piece of work. You could say it's, it's an addition of an essay uh, or a piece of music, or as in the case of Git, source code. And uh, we'll let there be an arrow I, will, I call it arrow on the slide. I should really be consistent and call it an edge, but uh, I've used both. We let there be an edge from B to A if B actually modified A. If B added something to A or used A to create something new uh, directly. So say you added in B, you added to the essay that you started out with in A, you add an edge. Or you started that with a song and you reorchestrated it. Uh, you made some changes to it. Add an edge. Or you changed the source code by implementing new features. You add an edge. Um, of course, the node that you start out with, the basis for it all, that will not have any parents. Um, but um, uh, so, so a node can have zero parents. It can also have one or more. Like if you integrate many pieces of work. Uh, you're going to have more than one parent. And again, since work cannot be based on itself, you cannot create something by having created it already. Uh, a graph that uh, connects these pieces based on what they're based on will have to be acyclic. That's why it gives rise this kind, this way of keeping track of what follows from what, what led to what will lead to a DAG. So I, I have an example here. Um, I'm a jazz fan myself, so I took some songs that I knew from the jazz world. Like I Got Rhythm, it's maybe one of the most famous jazz standards of all time because it's, it's led to tons of what's called contra facts in jazz. People took the chord progression of I Got Rhythm and played new melodies and made new songs from it. I Got Rhythm is so famous, the chord changes are basically just called rhythm changes. Uh, so here are three songs that were made with rhythm changes. Olio by Sonny Rollins, Anthropology by Charlie Parker, and interestingly enough, Meet the Flintstones. I'm not sure if any of you have ever watched the Flintstones TV series, which was huge in, I don't know, the 50s or 60s in America, and there have been tons of movies, etc., etc. Uh, I hope you've seen the Flintstones. Uh, the, the, the theme song is based on I Got Rhythm. Now, of course, these pieces of work have yet again led to other pieces of work. Bill Evans covered Olio and thereby added to Sony Rollins' work or built upon it and created something new. Bootsy's Rubber Band, which is this strange, psychedelic, funky 70s uh, band, uh, uh, they uh, actually sampled Meet the Flintstones in the song Bootzilla, and then Childish Gambino uh, sampled Bootzilla in his song Redbone. So uh, here's a graph of how these pieces of work are connected into a DAG. And uh, let's take an example from literature. So the Bible is an old text that uh, has been very important for a lot of literature that came after it. Catcher in the Rye references, I think, the story of uh, Jesus and Judas. Uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin references the Bible. Hamlet definitely references the Bible. And Catcher in the Rye and Uncle Tom's Cabin also reference Hamlet. Uh, Perks of Being a Wallflower uh, has some references to Catcher in the Rye in it. Holden Caulfield, etc., etc. And To Kill a Mockingbird, Atticus Finch. Ghost Set the Watchman is a sequel of To Kill a Mockingbird. So it builds on To Kill a Mockingbird and To Kill a Mockingbird definitely has some references to the Bible in it. So here you go, a literary graph that shows what adds to what, what references what. And Uri says that uh, Perks of Being a Wallflower is a great book. That's great because that's next on my reading list. So I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> but yeah, does this make sense? Once you try and keep track of what builds on what, uh, what references what, what integrates what work, you actually get a DAG.
Make sense or not? Of course, we're going to, uh, I, I think you probably see where this is going because we're now thinking of your code base as being a piece of work that you can add to or change or even integrate different versions of. So here we're, uh, now we're in the Git world. This is a commit graph from some repository. Basically each node here is a commit. And uh, you don't have the arrows drawn here, uh, but up top is the first commit. So since uh, edges point back to the ancestors, uh, you'll have to think here that edges point upwards. So the next commit there, the one that starts with 3E89, which is a hash, uh, everything is connected here. Uh, that node has an edge that points back to the master commit which has hash 6C6, etc., etc., um, And then someone built on uh, that commit and created a new commit, a new piece of the source code. And that one has an edge that goes back to its ancestor, its parent, etc. And then someone put, uh, and someone made a change directly to the first commit, uh, 6650, and that points directly back to the first commit because it modified that commit directly. And then you uh, some integration happens. Uh, if we follow the gray line downwards to 8F1, someone integrated the change that happened to the first commit and whatever happened on the blue, blue handle there. I'm not going to call it a branch because we're going to use the word branch later on. Uh, and branches are going to be a different entity altogether. So let me just call it a handle or a spout or something. It, uh, I, I'm not going to use the word branches out, even though that's what it looks like. Um, so some work was integrated. Also, someone took a piece, the piece of work on the blue line there, uh, basically commit E188, and they made some changes to it uh, and created EAF. 618, uh, that's the commit on the yellow line there, and that got integrated later on, and so on. So yeah, the commit graph keeps track of what modified what, because as you know, creation is a messy process, and you might go through many iterations of doing something, adding through it, adding to it, uh, deciding it was a bad idea, doing something else, going back, thinking it wasn't such a bad idea after all, adding to it, reintegrating both lines of work, etc., etc. This happens in every endeavor, every creative endeavor out there, as well as coding, which is also a creative endeavor. Uh, and that's why Git has to organize things in this way. The commit graph, the graph that shows where uh, what followed from what is a DAG. And of course, the visual representations of that DAG might uh, differ. Uh, that's not essential. What's essential is how things are connected. So this is yet another representation of a graph, uh, of a commit graph in Git. Someone has even labeled some branches here. Z is labeled as release. So, Z is labeled with a branch and F is labeled master and four is labeled topic. Uh, we're going to talk about what those labels mean. You're also going to learn why I'm calling them labels, even though you're used to calling them branches. Uh, but for now, what's essential is you have commits and they relate to each other by what followed from what and what integrated what. And yeah, here's yet another one. So there you go. All of these found online, I should definitely include the sources. So I'll have to remember to update the slides with the sources of where those uh, pictures came from. And oh yes, yet another one. But hopefully by now you can recognize the essential features of a DAG, nodes and edges. Sometimes people don't draw the directions of those edges and they're just implied by the way you lay the graph out on the paper. So here in this case, it looks as if the edges are supposed to go from right to left. Uh, that's implied. They didn't draw it, but it's implied.
And okay, and uh, last thing I want to say about the nodes of a DAG is that a DAG specifically can be topologically sorted. That means that you can take the nodes of a DAG and you can create a flat list that has the feature that any node in that list will occur before all its descendants. So basically you can flatten it all down to a list where, uh, where ancestry is respected. Now the order isn't necessarily unique, but it exists. There's a, at least one way of doing it. So here uh, we've drawn out the DAG in a way that shows you the topological order here. And it seems like the first, let's call it a commit, the first node is down there in the bottom right corner. And if you just follow the, uh, the nodes back up diagonally, you'll see that they're listed in such an order that anything that occurs here will occur before its ancestors. Does that make sense? So let's have a look at an actual example of that. Here's a graph. Uh, it's a DAG and I've listed two possible topological orders. If I ask you to sort this graph topologically, you could say, well, I'm going to start with seven because the seven, because seven has no ancestors. Uh, so we start with that and then we can do four, five and six and they four, five and six are not related because of course, even though you have a notion of ancestry in a DAG, not every node is an ancestor of another node. Uh, nodes can be unrelated, just like people can be unrelated. Uh, then two and three, and then one. And I think that if you look at that order, everything is listed so that children come before parents. Um, and I there's another order there that is seven, five, six, four, three, two, one. Uh, they're listed in topological order. It's not unique, but the feature is still there. You can list them out linearly uh, in a way that respects uh, ancestry. And uh, this happens in the git log because the git log uh, res respects the graph structure of the entire commit graph, uh, but it needs to flatten it out and it gets flattened out into topological order. The, the most important takeaway from all of this is uh, actually, it's a, it's a quotation I found online on some person's blog, but I couldn't agree more. And it's one of the things that makes Git a bit complicated to learn. Namely, Git is so, uh, it's so tightly bound to its internal data structures and to operations on those data structures. That in order to understand Git, you really need to understand the commit graph and what you can do to it as a graph. So actually uh, the quote is, Git is not a version control tool. It's a graph manipulation tool that supports version control methodologies. <laughs> and I think you'll discover through this course that uh, that might be true in a lot of senses. Um, now the thing is through this course, we're going to use Git uh, in the terminal. I'm not going to use any graphical overlays on Git. And that is because, first of all, the main tool set, Git as it exists as a tool, is the program Git that lives on the command line. That's the official tool that includes everything Git can do. Anything on top of that, like a graphical visualization tool or <laughs> GitLab, which is even further out there, that's not part of Git itself. Those are just tools that you use to implement workflows on top of Git. Now, one of the common problems when you have layers upon layers of uh, programs that, uh, that create graphical overlays or add another tool set on top, of, on top of the original one, that's supposed to make things easier. Very often they don't. And this is, a, uh, this is a problem that's referred to in computer science very often as leaky abstractions. Uh, have you heard that term before? Leaky abstractions, abstractions that leak into each other as a leaky faucet or leaky pipe. Uh, 
the reason they say uh, the reason we talk about leaky abstractions or what it means to say that something is a leaky abstraction is that uh, if you have a tool that you that is opposed to make things easier to put graphical front ends of things where when something goes wrong or uh, when something goes right <laughs> even uh, the result whatever happened can't be explained unless you delve into the underlying tool set uh, that's when you have a leaky abstraction so the tool set on top uh, will be almost impossible to use, at least for certain cases, unless you know exactly what's happening underneath it. Uh, that happens a lot with uh, graphical overlays on top of Git and a lot of programs that are said to make Git easier. I found, at least uh, when I've worked with Git and a lot of my colleagues as well, um, that means that it's when if you want to learn Git, I would highly advocate that you learn how to use the Git command line tool. That is Git at its core. Uh, and after you've learned Git, after you've learned how it works internally, after you learn how the command line works, then you can progress on to the abstraction above because then you can actually deal with all these leaky cases where things go wrong up here and you need to understand why it went wrong by looking down here. Uh, so again, we'll be using the Git command line uh, and uh, make sure that you're happy about bringing up Git in the terminal and uh, typing out commands and doing things there because that's what we'll be doing for the remainder of the course. Okay, uh, that's the end of what I wanted to talk about today. Uh, any questions? Did you feel that uh, there, this was enlightening at all? I mean, we've looked at two very different theoretical uh, tools. We've looked at hashes, we looked at DAGs, uh, but they show up in Git everywhere. So when we now go and look at the internals of Git uh, in the next class, we're going to use both of those tools that we've now learned about in order to understand what's happening. So yeah, questions, anything, comments? Tell me if uh, you thought this was, uh, uh, okay, did we go too fast today? Was anything covered too deeply? Maybe things, uh, maybe we went into too much details in, uh, with certain topics and not enough with others. Well, very good. Now we have a problem set uh, that I hope you will uh, that I hope will be given to you. Uh, it might be a bit challenging. It's made to be challenging. Uh, so if some of it is too challenging, uh, that's fine and understandable. Try and do it all uh, because it contains a lot of. Uh, it, 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 it requires you to work with the concepts we've defined today in real life and see how they can be used. Uh, you might have to be a bit creative, get out your problem solving skills. I think there is a typo in one of the documents. I think you're asked to topologic, uh, topologically sort a graph. Uh, and it says that uh, the order is such that every node comes before, uh, uh, well, everything that comes after node is its ancestor or something. Um, I don't have the document here. I die, I should have had it. But the wording is wrong. Of course, remember that in a DAG, Two nodes don't have to be ancestors. They can be unrelated. So when you write out a top topological sort of a graph, it isn't necessarily the case that uh, a child occurs after, well, if this occurs after this, then this is necessarily the child or parent of this. That, that is not true. And I think that was implied by the wording in one of the, in one of the problems. So remember that. So that's the end of today's course. Thank you very much. I'll see you again next week uh, when we'll be talking about Git internals and um, uh, Git's object storage. All right, thank you very much. Have fun with the exercises. See you again next week. Bye-bye.